But take your Bibles and open them to the, one of the most famous passages of Scripture in all the Bible. One that you learned when you were a child. One that you see if you watch any kind of sports activities. See the stands in the stadiums. You'll see somebody holding up a sign that says John 3.16. We're going to take a look at three verses in that passage of Scripture this morning. And we're going to take a look at the theme or the subject, the title, Whosoever Will. Aren't you glad God said, Whosoever Will? That means anybody, everybody. doesn't matter what color you are, what language you speak, what culture you are, what part of the world you live in. Whosoever is whosoever. And so we're going to take a look at that this morning and praise God for that. Amen. I draw your attention to that as we read. But isn't it uh, so important for you and I today to understand the heart of God? And we want to share the heart of God with you this morning because it is the heart of God is love. Amen. So we're going to take that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The word begotten means unique. That whosoever, that who? That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not, notice, is condemned already. Now why? Because he hath not believed in the name of of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. The Bible tells us in 1 John 4.10, Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation or the covering or the atonement for our sins. May we pray together. Our Father, how we thank you for this wonderful passage of Scripture. First of all, we thank you because it is the very Word of God. We thank you for penning it in for us and giving it to us. We thank you for what it means. We thank you for the wonderful verse of John 3.16 that we many of us have learned when we were a kid. And we've memorized it, and to this very day, we can still quote it. And Father, if that's all the Bible we had, it would be all we would need. And so, Father, we thank you, we praise you for it. We ask it now as it goes forth over Rumble, Facebook, YouTube, the Internet, uh, the website, television, radio, that a multitude of people will be saved and come to know Christ to whom to know is life everlasting. May they understand and sense and feel the love of God today and how much He really, really does love them. And Lord, how much You really love us as well. May it be a fresh and new in our hearts today as we look at this wonderful passage of Scripture before us. Father, bless it, anoint it, it's Your Word. And Lord, bless and anoint Your servant today. Father, we pray for the power of God would come upon us. Your anointing would come upon us. And we would be able to stand in this place with boldness and freedom to proclaim the message of the truth of God's Word, that God does love the whole world. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. How many of you have ever heard of Frederick Lehman? Wrote the beautiful song entitled, the love of God. Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. The love of God. I read that, and I want to start singing it. But David's already shared with us. So we'll leave it at that. Amen. The love of God. Oh, I'll tell you what. God so loved the world, church, the world, the cosmos. That means you and I. How much did God really love us? Well, we have to take a look at, first of all, God revealed his love to us. God revealed 
His love to us. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Oh, you see, I want you to know this love was so great. It was a sacrificial love. God gave His Son. Amy Carmichael said, You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. Someone says, well, just how does God love me? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God loves you and I so much that he sent his son to die on a cross for you and I, who came, was born of a virgin, lived and walked among us for 33 and a half years, was killed, executed by a cruel execution, went to the cross, even on the cross, praying, Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. And there he died with two criminals, two thugs, as if he himself was a criminal. And so there he died, and he was buried in a borrowed tomb, because he only needed it for three days. See, well, you don't need it permanently. You just borrow something. Now, I love people that borrow tools and never return them. It's amazing. Anybody ever had that happen to you? That's why you're to give it to them as if you're giving them a gift, the Bible says. Give it to them and not expect it in return. Then you won't worry about it and lose sleep over it. Amen. Amen. But oh, thank God when Jesus went into the tomb, he only needed it three days. Because on the third day, he rose again. Victorious. He went to hell for you and I. He took the keys from the devil and said, they're mine. Give them here. They don't belong to you. And he conquered sin, hell, death, and the grave for all eternity. Why? Because God so loved the world. You and I are that world. And that's how much God loves you today. Now, you may be out there today and, and, and you feel like nobody loves you. And you may really feel that. And, and some of you, I don't doubt that that may be true in your life. You may be abandoned, you may be homeless, you may be an orphan, you may have been given up and you're just going through life that nobody, nobody loves me. I got some good news for you. Somebody loves you and his name is Jesus. And he loves you more than you'd ever know. No matter what heart and heartache you've gone through, God loves you. And he loves you so much that the Bible says in Romans 5, 6, for when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely would a righteous man will die for one. Yet preadventure for a good man, some would even die, would dare to die. But God commendeth, that means God proved, God demonstrated his love towards us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus took your place. He died in your place. He took your sin nailed it to his cross, died for you, buried for you, rose again for you, ascended into glory for you, and coming back again someday for you. Hallelujah. As to where he will, we will be with him in glory. Oh, how much does God love the world? He revealed it. See, there's one thing to say, yeah, I love you. And the people hear that and say that, but you know what? I've always thought actions are greater than words. The Bible says we're not to love just in words, but in deeds, you see. And so there's a great, no, great, Jesus said there's no greater love than this, than that a man would lay down his life for a friend. And in the next verse, he said, ye are my friends. He says, and by the way, he said, when it comes time for that, let me assure you. He says, no man is going to take my life from me. He said, I'm going to lay it down freely. No man may take it from me. And he says, guess what? I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. And the Romans didn't take him. The Jews didn't take him. He freely, freely went without any fight or struggle, you see. And when he died, he died when he wanted to die, you see. They were going to stab him with a spear. They were going to break his legs. But the Roman soldier said, he's already dead. Because he cried out, to tell us I, to tell us I, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And when it was finished, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and died. But three days later, he said, hey, guess what? I'm alive again forevermore. Hallelujah. God loves you so much. 
He let his own son die for you. No matter what you've done, no matter whatever sins or crimes you have committed or been involved in, I'm telling you, God loves you. Now, the world doesn't love you. The world will hate you. The world will beat you, the world will beat you up. The world will take advantage of you. The world will abuse you. The, Lord, the world will do everything to you. Now, they may tell you, the devil will even tell you he loves you. Oh, he will. It'll be a sensual love. It'll be a passionate love. You know, see, it'll be an immoral love. But the devil will tell you he loves you. He'll convince you that he loves you. But no, he doesn't. He doesn't love you. He wants to take you to hell with him. The devil doesn't love anybody but himself. Okay? But God loves you. You see, I'll tell you what. You say, why? Because God proved it. The devil didn't prove he loved you. He didn't die for you. He didn't take your sins and put them on the cross. He didn't rise again the third day. He didn't have nothing to do with it. That's how much God loves you. How in the world today people can say that God doesn't love them? Oh, my friend, don't ever say that to make that statement. God does love you, and God proved it. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Here it is. God was manifest in the flesh. That's how much God loves you? God became a man. God left the portals of glory, came down here and clothed himself in humanity, lived and dwelt and walked us and lived among us and walked among us, and then he went to the cross and died, buried and rose again and ascended back into glory. God became man. That's how much God loves you. Why in the world would God ever want to lay aside his deity and his glory and clothe himself in flesh in humanity and come and live in a sin-sick world where people wouldn't love him or care for him and then nail him to a cross and kill him. Why would he want to do that? I'll tell you why. Because he loves you. He loves you. You say, well, I've done this and I've done that and I've committed this. So what? The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. There's not a sin you've ever committed, ever will commit, or ever done that the blood of Christ cannot cleanse it and wash it and make it white as snow. Oh, my friend, God loves you. He proved it. Oh, God was manifest in the flesh. He was justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles. Hallelujah. Believed on in the world. Hallelujah. And received up in the glory. Amen. That's how much God loves you. That's how much God loves you today. Dr. Gershom Machen said this, You may accept the lofty claims of Jesus. You may take him as a very God, uh, or else you must reject him as a miserable, deluded enthusiast. There is really no middle ground. Jesus refuses to be pressed into the mold of a mere religious teacher. He is God Almighty. He is the Christ. He is the Savior. He is the Anointed One. Matter of fact, if you don't think so, I, in question, I would challenge you to take all the religious world leaders that have come and gone on the scene. Look them up. Look at their names. Who know who they are. The religious groups, religious leaders, claim to be this, claim to be that. Go to where their graves are. Dig them up, and you will find bones. But go to Jerusalem, and go to the tomb of Jesus, and it's empty. There's nothing <laughs> There, you see. Oh, my friend, I'm telling you, not only do we have this sacrificial gift, the, crack, the fact that Jesus died on the cross, but we have this atoning gift, this atoning gift that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, should not perish. This atoning gift that God sent his son to be the propitiation it's words found three times in the New Testament. And there's a couple other places where we use the word reconciliation that could also be translated propitiation. But it means a covering. God covers our sin. God atoned for our sins. Let's see. Ephesians 1, 7. In whom, that is in Christ, we have what? Redemption. How do we have this redemption? Through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of of his grace. Colossians 1:14 in whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sin. 2 Corinthians 5:18 and all things are of God who hath reconciled us. There's where we can put in that word propitiation to himself by Jesus Christ and then has given to us 
the ministry of reconciliation. You know what we're doing here this morning? We're doing the ministry of reconciliation. We're telling men and women and boys and girls, no matter who they are, what color they are, where they live, what language they speak, that they can be brought back into a relationship uh, with God through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're trying to reconcile men and women, boys and girls, the lost back to Christ through the ministry of reconciliation. Praise God. Praise God. Oh, you see, the atoning gift. Aren't you glad that Jesus atoned for your sins? You see, aren't you? In the Old Testament, you see, the priest, the high priest, had to do it once a year. First, he had to do the atoning for his own sins. Then he had to go into the Holy of Holies. And there we would find the, the Ark of the Covenant. In the Ark of the Covenant contained the tablets of ten uh, commandments. There was the rod, the blood of Moses in there. And on top of it was a covering, a lid. And on top of that was two cherubs, one on each side with their wings folded up, and, and uh, that of either of praise or in reverence to God. And in between the two cherubs was the presence of God in the Holy Spirit of God, and the presence of God was to be in that place. And it was called the mercy seat. It was called the covering. And the high priest would go in with the slain of a perfect animal with without spot, without blemish, slit their throat, collect the blood, because without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. And they would go in and they would take and pour that out on the mercy seat. Because you see, when God looked down from heaven and he would look at the mercy seat, it was a time of judgment. It was a judgment for our sins and for the people. But when God looked down after that act and he saw the blood, you see, that's all he could see. He couldn't see the judgment anymore. For when I pass by, when I see the blood, I will pass by. Hallelujah. When God sees you are washed and cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. Now, folks, if you don't think the devil's real, you start preaching about the blood of Jesus Christ and the redemption of man's soul with the blood, the devil's mad. He's angry, and he's going to do everything he can do to disrupt it. So please don't let these stops or anything else disrupt it. You hang in here with me. Hey, keep your thought in mind what's going on. Shout a little bit. Say amen once in a while. That kind of encourages me a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Give me a, give me a hallelujah once in a while. Okay, amen, if you don't mind that. I'll do the left hand here. You see, and can I get a witness from you once in a while? All right? That helps. And then every now and then you can say, preach it, brother. All right? See, that, that lets me know you're with me this morning. All right? Praise God. Praise God. Oh, the atoning gift. God revealed his love. That brings me to the second point this morning. Now, here's the, here's the sad thing. After all what I just said, and of course, we could go on and on for weeks and months just on that. Just on that one verse, okay? There's so much sex for Jesus we could do in that verse. It would be unbelievable. But we just give you a little, ex you know, we just give you a little expositional, expository preaching of it today. But here's what's, here's what's sad. Here is what's so sad. That mankind rejects his love. Mankind rejects his love. You remember what we read? Light came into the world. Who's the light? Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And the Bible says that men rejected that light. They rejected the Christ, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus. Why? Because they loved darkness more than they loved light because their deeds were evil. And we live in a dark world today, ladies and gentlemen. We live in a world today that people reject the gospel. We live in a world today where they reject Jesus. We live in a world today they don't want anything to do with Jesus. I mean, you know, so it's quite obvious, you see. I mean, and that's why, here's something really cool. Everybody, I was listening to a preacher this week, and I said, oh, you missed one thing in that verse, brother. He was talking about the end times and all the signs around us pointing to the coming of the Lord. And I agree with him on that. I mean, they're here, they're there, you name it. Uh, first and ten, second Timothy, both, we've got it. They're there. I mean, they're here. Uh, there's no question about it that the signs of the times are all around us for the coming of the Lord. And, and then there's wars and rumors of wars and nation against nation and plagues and disease. Man, we're getting hit by it all around the place, all around the world simultaneously. And Jesus told the nation of Israel, when you see all these things happen simultaneously around the world, look Look up, for your redemption draweth nigh. But Jesus told his men, listen, you're going to hear all of this. He said, but be not troubled, for these things must come to pass. So it's all happening just like Jesus said. But the end is not yet. Here he is, he says, and this gospel shall be preached in all the world, and then shall the end come. Notice what it did not say. It did not say that this gospel shall be heard in all the world. It, notice it did not say that this gospel shall be received 
in all the world because the majority of the world rejects it and doesn't see it. He just said it shall be preached in all the world and then shall the end come. And I'm telling you today on the authority of God's word and all the electronics we got and shortwave radio and television and the media and YouTube and duck duck and you name it, Facebook, r- rumble rumble and sumble sumble and timble timble, I don't care what it is, the gospel is being preached around the world today as I'm standing here. That's why it's ready and time for the coming of the Lord, but you'll miss it if you're not saved. Amen. Amen. Right? Men reject his love. Why? Because their deeds are evil. They'd rather live in darkness. When are most crimes committed? In the dark? Under cover of dark? Isn't it? It is. Man, I'm telling you. John 3, 19. And this is the condemnation. Here's the judgment. That light is come into the world. And men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Why? Because of the depravity of man. The total depravity of man. Folks, we got to get this idea out of us that we're so good and wonderful. Okay? We have those that teach and even preach from their platform pulpits that man is not totally deprived. That there is an ounce of goodness, there is some goodness and light in everyone and, you know, and all this stuff. That's all New Age thinking. You can become a God yourself and all of this because you're so good and you're so wonderful. Folks, if that was the case and that be true, we don't need a Savior. We wouldn't need Jesus. But because we're totally depraved, we need a Savior. How many of you agree we're sinners this morning? How many of you have sinned this morning? How many of you still sin? Anybody perfect in here today? No, I don't think so. That's why we need a Savior. And God knew that, so that's why he gave us Jesus. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Oh, because of total depravity. The deprived depraved mind is anti-God. It's anti against Christ, the Word, and everything. That's the total depravity of man. It's crooked. Uh, It's bad. It's corrupt. It's perverted. The mind of men. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says there is none of us righteous. No, not one. There's none of us that have done any good. No, not one. We've all gone out of our way and become unprofitable servants. Go read Romans chapter 3. And you'll get a good clear understanding of it. But let's go back to see the total depravity of man real quickly. Romans chapter 1, verse 28 through 32. Now I don't have time to expand on all of that passage of scripture. Because that's a different subject. But you'll kind of get it here when we read a little bit of it, all right? And even as they did not like to retain God. Notice, they did not like to retain God. That means they knew God. Hello. In their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Now, I want to tell you, it's not too late yet for some of you. But when God gives you over, you're given over. You've done signs your death warrant crossed God's deadline because God gave you over. But if you still got a breath in your breath and you got an opportunity to repent and turn to Christ, you ought to come to Christ. Turn them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, who knowing, knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Now that whole passage of Romans is talking about the sin of immorality. It's talking about lasciviousness. It's talking about stuff that's being taught today, pushed down everybody's throats and our kids and everything else. God hates it. God doesn't like it. And it's going to cost a judgment one day. And my friend, and if you continue and live in that and practice that, God has given you over to a reprobate, corrupt, evil mind. And you've signed your death warrant. Now somebody's got to tell you the truth. Now don't get mad at me because I do. Remember, I didn't script it or write it. I just quote it. Okay? Good. Amen. I'm not saying that's another message and it's time. And I have preached on that message. On that. And I have named it. Told, called the newspaper. Told them we're preaching on this. Amen. Uh, Deuteronomy 4, 8 and 9. And what nation is there so great that has statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? God talking to the nation of Israel. Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently. 
lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life, but teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. First John 3, 4, Whatsoever or whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for the sin is the transgression of the law, speaking about God's moral law. So you see, man rejects the love of God today. Folks, it don't take a, I'll just use the word and don't get mine because it's in, the, it's in the dictionary. You don't have to be a moron to figure that out. Moron means simply empty-headed, stupid-headed. That's what the word means. To figure out what's going on. And to see that mankind as a whole around the world hates God, hates the word of God. They don't want anything to do with him. And they love their darkness and their evil deeds. And we're promoting it more and more. I'm telling you. Oh, my friends, just, just, just wake up and smell the roses. Mankind rejects the, word, the love of God. They don't want anything to do with it. Now you, you can read Romans 13, 1 through 4. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God, the powers that are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resisteth shall receive to themselves damnation or judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the, the minister of God to, the, to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. You see, God tells us we're to obey the government. And we're to obey the authority that's over us. That means our government, it also means in the church. I heard that pen hit the carpet. Amen. But oh, do we have a hard time with the government, don't we? Today, man doesn't want to obey the government. Man doesn't want to submit to it. Same thing in the church. You see, C.S. Lewis, before he became a Christian, or just shortly after he did, said this, My argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe, universe with when I called it unjust? Uh, C.S. Lewis, before he became a Christian and, and, and found the Lord. You see, there's no more respect for God today. There's such a lack of respect for the Word of God today. There's a lack of respect for the church today. There's a lack of respect for authority today. And there's a lack of respect for the law today. If you don't think so, why do you think all of our gov gov governments and states are all trying to defund the police? You do that, and you're going to have pure anarchy. But that's what they want. Mankind rejects his love. The love of God. They don't want anything to do with it. But you say, well, then, preacher, then why are we preaching about it? <laughs> I'm glad you asked that, that question. <laughs> because, you see, it doesn't matter what man thinks or does. God still loves the world. And God still gave his son for the world. Doesn't matter what you are, who you are. God still loves you. Oh, you see. Oh, man rejects uh, his love uh, because of depravity. Man rejects his love because of sin. Because of sin. Folks, we're all sinners. We were born into sin. We inherited a sin nature, you see. Now, I know there are preachers that won't preach that. One of them's out there in Houston, Texas. Had 50,000 in his auditorium this morning. Never mentioned sin. Never talk about hell. Never talk about judgment. Well, folks, that's in the Bible. And so if you're not going to preach those things, what are you preaching? Philosophy. Every man can be good and become a god in himself because you're so wonderful. Oh, my goodness. No, you see. Oh, you see, why did man reject his love? Because of sin. The Bible says in Romans 5, 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin, who was that one man? Adam. Sin entered into the world. And death by sin. There's the punishment. There's the penalty. And so death passed upon all men. Why? 
For we all have sinned. We're born into sin. We sin because of our nature. We sin because of our, uh, we, we practice sin. We choose to sin. I mean, folks, let's face it, you see. And so that's why man rejects God's love. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody has sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is no uh, sinless person in this place. The Bible doesn't teach and preach sinless perfection. You see, we've all come short of the glory of God. We've all missed the mark. We're all no good, rotten, stinking sinners. Amen? Just some of us are saved sinners. That's the difference. <laughs> Praise the Lord. 1 John 1, 8 and 10. Now here, I, I love this. I've had people tell me, well, Pastor, I, I don't sin. I'm a good person. I'm a righteous person. I do good and I love and I do righteous. I, I don't sin. Then you can sit and ask them some questions, and, and you know, and get down to some get down to some really really silly questions, and then they start thinking a little bit, and then and it's amazing. I, no, I, I don't think I've ever done that, and I go, wow, that's amazing. You're the first perfect person I've ever met, outside of the one I met spiritually through faith in Christ. He's the only perfect person I know, but it's good to know there's a second one. How many people said, well, I don't sin, or I haven't sinned? Well, let's see what the Bible says. In 1 John 1, 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him, that is God, a liar, and his word is not in us. So, my friend, I've got some... Unfortunately, some sad news for you. You're a sinner. And you've sinned against a holy and righteous God. And I don't care what the sin is, how bad or how gross or how wicked or how evil. You may be sitting on death row today. You may have been a serial killer. You may have committed some of the most horrible crimes that mankind knows of. I want to tell you something right now. God loves you. And God will forgive you of that sin or sins. Well, you don't know how immoral I've lived and the sexual immorality that my life has been involved in of every kind of sexual sin and immorality you can think of. I want to tell you something. God loves you and will forgive you. Don't let anybody else tell you different. Don't let the devil tell you that. Don't let the world tell you that because the world hates God. So does the devil, by the way. Well, you see, when we talk about man rejects his love because of depravity, because of sin, but it lets you know sin brings a penalty. There's going to be a penalty, my friend, and that is death separated from God for all eternity. The penalty of sin. Romans 6.23 says what? For the wages of sin is what? death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you have a choice. You got to make that choice. James 1.15 says, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth, talk to me, death. death. Ezekiel 18.4, behold, all souls are mine as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Hebrews 9, 27. And it is appointed unto men once to die, after that, the judgment. They reject His love, even when they know the penalty. You see, that's what's sad. People would reject the love of God when they know the penalty. And the ultimate penalty, church, listen to me, is death separated from God for all eternity. And you say, I don't, like, I don't get it. You just told me that God so loved the world. Absolutely He does. But I also told you that men reject that love. Wow. Well, we come to a close. We've learned this morning that God revealed His love. Amen? 
But we also learn that mankind rejects that love. And you may know people who have. Come on, talk to me. How many of you know somebody that rejects God's love? I mean, you personally know them. Whether they're your friend, an acquaintance, somebody you work with, a family member, whatever. You've tried to talk to them, share, and you're not getting anywhere. You might as well talk to that wall. They simply say, I don't want anything to do with it. That's not my thing. That's your thing. Fine, go for it, whatever. That's not for me. I don't want it. I don't want nothing to do with it. And even after you sit and try to tell them, that listen, if you reject God's love, you will spend an eternity in a place called hell. Totally separated from the love of God and heaven and Christ and the angels and the apostles and the prophets and everybody else that knows Jesus for all eternity. And they'll look at you and say, so? And you just say, man, I, I can't comprehend this. How could people, Josh, how could people think that way? After you tell them, after you show them, that's when you want to just be unkind and say, you moron? Are you empty-headed? Are you stupid-headed? That's what the word means. Look it up in the dictionary. Because that's the way they, it's almost like the way they act. And, and they go through life, sometimes this is a big one, they just simply don't believe it. And if they do, they reject it. Folks, that's not going to change the matter. You cannot believe this all you want to. You can reject this all you want to. But I'm telling you, this is the truth. This is the Bible. This is the Word of God. And you have an opportunity today. Oh, thank God you have an opportunity today to make the right choice. It's up to you. I can't make it for you. And I know all of you are sitting here saying, hallelujah, praise the Lord. I've heard this a thousand times. Good, now today's a thousand and one. Don't ever get tired of hearing how you got saved. Don't ever get tired of hearing about the love of God who you accepted and believed one day, my friend, because it ought to be real. Oh, I know it's real. It's real in my soul. Hallelujah. You can, be, you can respond to God's love today. You have to make a choice. A choice has to be made. John 3, 16, here it is again, for God so loved the world, say that's me. Whoever you are that are listening, just say it, that's me. That he gave his only begotten son, that's what God did for you. That here it is, that whosoever, say that's me. Come on, say that's me. I hope some of you are in here, that's you. And those of you that are watching, here's the choice. Whosoever believeth, believeth in him. Here it is, should not perish, but have everlasting life. See, you've got to make a choice to believe. The Bible says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Hallelujah. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, and with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. Hallelujah. you got to make a choice today. Why are you preaching so hard on all of this? It's my last chance. Maybe my last time. And I'm going to stand before God one day and say, Lord, I hope I did all right for you. I hope I did the best I could for you. All I could do was tell them. I can't make the choice for them. See, I don't have to answer to you. i got to answer to him. And after I saw this week so many people got killed, Shootings, homes, found five dead here, ten dead over here, eight dead over here. Somebody went wild in Mexico yesterday, I think it was, gunned down a bunch of people. And, and all this week, and I'm thinking, my Lord, people need the Lord. People need to get saved. And the only way they're going to do it is they got to hear, for whosoever will may come. For whosoever will may call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hallelujah. I'm glad that happened to me one day. I'll never forget it. Oh, you see, you got to make a choice. Acts 17, 30. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. I don't want to hear that word. Well, you won't if you go out to Houston, Texas. 
Isn't that sad? That God has given that man money, facilities, national television, an opportunity to talk to people, to tell people there's a judgment coming, that a man and woman, a boy and girl are sinners, and they need to be saved, and there's a judgment, and that hell awaits them if they don't come to Christ. We'll never preach anything like that. I'm telling you, God will hold that man responsible. And I'll tell you the honest truth. The Bible said that in these days there's a lot of false preachers and teachers out there. And a man never preaches anything like what I'm preaching today, never, ever. I wonder and doubt if the man's even saved and born again. You can be all the goodness you want. You can gain all the wealth you want. You can have all the material you want. You can even, as his wife gets up and preaches, you can become a god yourself. What false teaching and doctrine. That's heresy. That is damnable heresy. You and I could no more become God than the man in the moon. He'd have more of a chance than you do, and China wants to buy the moon. This I got to see who's going to sell it. God sits up there, the Bible says, and laughs at all of this stuff. Amen. Repent. Well, I'm not going to preach on repentance. That's negative. The Bible tells me to preach on repentance. Jesus said this. I tell you this. Unless you all, unless you all likewise repent, you shall perish. Peter put it this way, God's not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but his long suffering towards us that all come to repentance. God wants everybody, it's the will of God to come to repentance. Jesus said, I would that men everywhere be saved. Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3 3, he answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He told Nicodemus that three times. Nicodemus was a good man. Nicodemus was a moral man. Nicodemus was a righteous man. Nicodemus was a highly religious man, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was a leader of his community. He was well respected and looked up to, but he was lost. He was lost without Christ. And Jesus said to that man, in all of his goodness, in all of his wealth, in all of his whatever he had, in all of his righteousness, in all of his religion that he had. He said, Nicodemus, you must be born again or you're not going to heaven. Amen. Your goodness isn't going to get you to heaven. Your righteous self-righteousness isn't going to get you to heaven. Your money's not going to get you to heaven. Your wealth and gain isn't going to get you to heaven. Your popularity is not going to get you to heaven. The only thing that's going to get you to heaven is Jesus. Amen. Jesus told Thomas, Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He used the definite article, the. He didn't say he was a way or some way. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man is going to come unto my Father except by me. The only way you're going to get to heaven is through the cross. you got to come by the way of the cross. you got to come through the blood of the Lamb, my friend. And you come through that, first of all, by repentance and repenting of your rotten, stinking sin that we all are. Amen. And we ask God to forgive us and to cleanse us and wash us, and He will. Hallelujah to the praise be the glory of God. And then we receive Him. We ask Him to come into our hearts and life and make us a new creature. And we're born again. And that gives us a guarantee we're going to heaven. Hallelujah. He had to tell Nick that three times. And Nick still didn't get it. And he went on and kept talking to him until he came to John 3, 15 and 16 and 17 and 18 and 19, which we read today. And later on, we discovered that Nicodemus got saved and born again. You're going to get to meet him one day in heaven if you know him. So you can respond today by his love. It's a choice that you have to make. And, and, and it's a destiny that will change your life. You hold your destiny in your hands today as to where you will spend eternity, in heaven or hell. The choice is yours. You can't say, well, God will send me there. No, God proved he loved you by sending his son. God did everything in the world for you. Don't blame God. You send yourself there because you reject that love, you see. Your destiny, John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son, who's the Son? 
loud. Who's the son? Jesus. All right. And who is who? I say, that's me. What do you do? You believe on the son, Jesus. What's the results? You have everlasting life. That's your destiny. And he that believeth not the Son, Jesus, shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him already. You're already under judgment. But you don't have to stay under it. You can get out from under that judgment by making the right choice. You see, by coming to Christ, depending on the choice that you made, whether you're saved or lost, my friend, it's up to you. If you choose not to, then friend, you're in trouble. You're in deep trouble. Remember last week we looked at God was going to judge the world by Noah with a, with a flood? I've heard dying by water, drowning, is, is, a, is actually a very comfortable death. I've read on that. But the next one's going to be fire. Roasted alive to spend an eternity in a place called hell that the other preacher won't mention and talk about. See, he must not love you very much, even though he says he does. Because, see, Paul said, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? So I close with this, and I don't know if I'm going to hear, but we're going to go to the book of Revelation. It's in your notes. John says, And I saw a great white throne. This is the last judgment in the Bible. And him that sat on it, the Lord Jesus, who from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no more place for them. And I saw the dead, the small and the great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the first set of books, the books, your records of your works, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the other book, the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. For whosoever, that means anybody, that means you, shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. You have a choice today. Those of you that are here, those of you that are watching and listening, the choice is either to come to Christ and receive His love and be born again or not. That's your choice. Miss Liz, if I could make it for everybody, I would. How many of you believe if Jesus could, make, could have made that choice for everybody, he would do that? Oh, he would. Because he said, I'm not willing that anybody should perish. He said, I would that all men get saved. But you see, he can't make that choice. But what he did say, here's what I can do for you. He said, I'll come down there and live with you for a while. And I'll live a perfect and sinless life. And then I'll offer my life up for a, for a sacrifice. I'll go to the cross I'll pay for your sin, not my sin, because Jesus said, I didn't sin. He was perfect, but I'll pay for your sin, George. I'll pay for your sin, Juanita. I'll pray for your sin, Nancy. I'll pay for your sin, Jerry. I'll go to the cross and pay for your sin. Those that are watching and listening, I'll die a, 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 an executional, tortured death for you because I love you. I will be buried. But I will rise again the third day. And if you're willing to trust in me and believe me, heaven will be your home. Because when I left the planet after the resurrection, I went back to heaven, getting a place all prepared for you. And he said, if I go, I will again and prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And the way you know thereof. And Thomas said, Lord, I don't know the way. Jesus said, oh, Thomas, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. See, friend, you've got to come to Christ. You can't be saved the way you want to be saved. You can't come to Christ the way you want to come. It's not on your terms. It's on His terms. 
In his terms is you got to come by the way of the cross. you got to come by the way of the blood. There must be a repentance of sin and turning from sin and turning to Christ in faith and receiving him as your Lord and Savior. You've got to make that choice. Now, I've preached long and hard today, and I know that, but I don't know if I'll even make it home. The Lord may call me home. He may call you home. He may call those of you that are watching and listening. And this may be your last chance. This may be your last opportunity. I don't know. Would you come to Christ? He loves you so much that He died for you. But He didn't stay dead. (laughs) He arose on the third day. Oh, praise the Lord. Aren't you glad that one day in your life you were one of those whosoever that called on the Lord? Yeah, thank you, sisters. Thank you. Amen. Well, how about for everybody else? Don't you think everybody else ought to get a chance? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why we shared this message today after I read and saw everything that happened this week. Literally. I just could not believe this wicked hateful, sin world we live in. And I said, God, Jesus is the only answer. And men and women, boys and girls around the world, they need to hear the love of God and they need to hear the truth of the scriptures so that they can be a whosoever will and come to know you. And that way, when all these bad things happen, they're going to go to heaven because they know Jesus. And folks, I don't know about you, And I'm nobody, but I do want to take as many with me as I can. Amen. Amen. Paul said, I have become all things to all men that I might save some. You're not going to save them all, but I sure would like to save some. And I'd like to get in glory. And the Lord calls me up and says, come here, turn around. I don't know how he'll do it, but wouldn't it be wonderful Not that there's any competition or anything going on in heaven, Lord forbid. All right, all you out there, if this man led you to Christ personally, to his preaching, his teaching, I want you all to raise your hand. And he says, now look around you, son. Great is your reward. For here you've come home bringing your sheaves with you, rejoicing. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. Hallelujah. Are you saved today? I know it's late, but it's still two minutes to 12. Not bad for a Baptist preacher. I don't care if it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Souls are weighed in the balance. That's all I'm hearing about right now is souls. Wanting people to get saved and born again. And I hope that's your desire today. We're going to give you that chance right now. We're going to pray. It's not the prayer that saves you. Those are words communicating with God. What saves you is putting your faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Turning from your sins, repenting, and asking Him to forgive you and to come into your heart and light and be your Lord and Savior. We're going to do that right now. For those of you here in the auditorium as well, those that are listening on the radio, television, internet, YouTube, Facebook, a rumble, God bless you, thank you. Get saved today, I beg you, in Jesus' name. Pray with me. Dear God, that's right, go ahead. I confess with my mouth, you are the Lord from heaven. I confess that, yes, God, after listening to this, there's no doubt I'm a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me and to cleanse me. And I repent of it. And he will, my friend, he will. I do now believe in my heart that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. I believe he took my place. He died for me. He paid my sin debt. I believe he was buried. And I believe he rose from the dead three days later, according to the Bible. And so right now, Lord, by faith, I do call upon you and receive you into my heart and life be my Lord and my Savior, and to take me to heaven someday when I die. And I pray this simple little prayer of faith, believing in Jesus' name, amen and amen.